What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 28 of Breaking Bats, presented by Not For Long Media. I'm your host, Brian O'Grady. As always with me, my co-host, Justin Ayers, J.A. What's going on over there, dude? I know you got your Orioles colors on still. They're still going strong. How you feeling? I'm feeling good after that uh, Little League Classic game against the Red Sox on Sunday night. That was awesome. Uh, so it, it's cool to see the Orioles get national spotlight shine like that. I feel like it's they go like years between like national televised game appearances. I don't know why. It's like I'm a Wizards fan too, and they maybe get one TNT game a year, if that. It just the, the DMV sports never gets any love for that. So uh, yeah, I, I always always got to represent the, the the birds. They're just mashing the ball. So. Uh, I'm glad you noticed that. I did. Uh, I watched that game, and what a great – ended up being a great decision for MLB by having them on there because whoever – at the beginning of the year, people probably were like, ah, eh, <laughs> I don't know. But it ended up being absolutely awesome, and it was a great game. I watched uh, my former teammate, Jorge, Jorge Mateo, hit a base-clearing double to win the game. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good game to watch. I didn't know you were teammates with Jorge Mateo. He's the fastest guy alive. When was this? Padres legend, man. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Last year. <laughs> it was uh, me and him hanging out on the bench a lot. Yep. Dang. He, uh, like it's, he didn't get to play very much. He was just kind of there for pinch running purposes. And now he's having a pretty good year. And, yes, absolutely flies. Did anybody try absolutely to race him? Flies. Uh, no, I don't think any, I mean, Toddy's fast, but I, no one else would even, definitely even like come close and, uh, Jorge is pretty, I mean, he's special, special fast. Yes. yes he makes he fast guys look slow. I think like stat cast, like sprint speed or something. He's definitely top five. I think I looked it up the other day. I'll have to go back and double check that. But yeah, he's. One of the fastest guys in the league. It's so cool that the Orioles are able to scoop up him up off of waivers. Uh, I feel like half their team is a waiver claim at this point. So, uh, But the other thing I took away from that game was Adley Rutschman Mania. They put out a picture the Orioles did on social media with probably 300 people surrounding Adley, like it was the Beatles showing up somewhere. Uh, so Adley Mania spreads, and he did the thing where he slid down the hill up there in Williamsport on a cardboard box and uh, took a tumble at the end. So I'm not sure how the team allowed him to go do that. Usually you go see like Buster Only or one of like the TV people go do it. And I'm like, oh, that's the franchise catcher sliding down the hill. Cool. But it was okay. Yeah. I don't know. That looked like so much fun though. That's what we do in Pennsylvania. We slide down hills with cardboard boxes. (laughs) It looked electric. Uh, So yeah, shout out to Little League Classic next year. Nats Phillies. So we're going to keep keep it running. Yeah. Well, it makes sense to have some, you know, not that I'm sure they're going to mix it up, but Nats Philly is probably not that, and also not that you can have a lot of fans there or anything. But uh, geographically speaking, it makes sense to have those teams do it there. Yeah, absolutely. But it is Price it's up. a cool. I mean, it's a cool thing for sure. I uh, so we, I think we were talking about where Matt Adams was from in Pennsylvania, being in the middle of nowhere. I didn't realize Williamsport, Pennsylvania, was also in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I mean, it's that no, is yeah, there's yeah. That is Middle legitimately nowhere. nowhere. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, there's not, I mean, not a lot going on in the middle of Pennsylvania. In between Pittsburgh and Philly, there's not a lot going on. And <laughs> yeah, Williamsport is it's yeah, you're you're out there. There's there's not much except for except for the Little League World Series. And that's why they slide down hills with cardboard boxes. Nothing else to do in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. That's the number one attraction. <laughs> uh that's so funny. Um well, cool. All right. Well, uh, before we get rolling into this week's episode, uh, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Psalm Sleep. Are you having trouble getting enough sleep at night? I know I certainly am because I, you know, I, I'm still still not sleeping great at night. So I uh, definitely need to check out Psalm Sleep. It's got everybody covered. It's the scientifically advanced Psalm snack includes ingredients that are naturally found in your body like GABA, magnesium, and melatonin. Uh, sleep is the best form of recovery, and it's helped people everywhere take their game to the next level. It's simple. All you have to do is drink one serving 30 minutes before you go to bed, and your, ba- and your body will naturally calm itself down. Other sleep supplements leave you feeling groggy in the morning, but not Psalm sleep. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to conquer the day. Go to GetSom.com, click Shop, and enter the code BATS. That's B-A-T-S at checkout for 10% off your entire order of Psalm sleep. All right, Brian, in the news this week, 
Uh, I'm going to start us off with a quote. Uh, this is from over the weekend. Quote, we got to play better, period. And the great thing is, it's right in front of us. It's right here, and we can fix it. I'm, of course, uh, quoting Yankees manager Aaron Boone over the weekend. Uh, there's a lot of losing going on in the Bronx, and that that quote in that press conference where he slammed the table, uh, it just kind of personified everything because it's it was it was perfect. That's exactly what was going on in the minds of all these Yankees fans. They were angry, and then Boone just took it out on a desk in a press conference. It was electric. So uh, the Yankees have been in a slump the entire month of August. On July 8th, they had a 15-and-a-half game lead, and now it's down to eight, I think. They, they dropped three out of four to Toronto over the weekend. They, they got one on Sunday, but they had lost six series in a row. They're playing the Mets right now, but uh, good God. Uh, have you been keeping up with the Yankees and their free fall this, uh, this month? Yeah, I've definitely been watching it. Um, just holding out, holding out hope that my my prediction doesn't look as bad preseason. No, I'm just, just kidding. Um, I, man, they've they've had a lot of injuries. Losing Carpenter was huge. I mean, he was such an unbelievable find and part of that lineup. Uh, so when he got hurt, I mean that that sucked for him and for them. Um, obviously, they've other other injuries too. Stanton's on, on his way back. But, you know, man, they were playing such good – they were playing so good for so long that it was only a matter of time really till they had some sort of coming back to earth. It's been a, been a pretty rough coming back to earth. But, uh, you know, those, I'm, I'm, I, I think they're going to be fine. I do. Uh, beat the uh, Scherzer last night or the night before whatever it was and then, then as we're recording this they were they were beating the Mets again and judge hit number 48 so I still you know I I still think they're going to win the division it might get a little little closer than than the Yankee fans would would like but like you said before uh Toronto and and Tampa are playing playing pretty well but mm, not uh, I don't think to the point where you would be You'd be too too nervous if you're if you're a Yankees fan, but man, Boone, I, it's Boone gets so much hate, and I don't really know if, like the whole you know backstory and stuff to it, but but uh, the the press conference thing was was gold. That was hysterical. I mean, I don't know. You <laughs> you're doing it to a bunch of reporters. Like in my mind, if you were doing something, it should be like to the team, not to them, but. Uh, hey, I think they're they're one and zero and winning since he's done that or whatever. So maybe <laughs> maybe it got to the team, fire fire the reporters up, and everyone's just just ready to go now. So much frustration coming out of that Yankees locker room. You're right. So Boone took it out on the desk during a press conference. Garrett Cole over the weekend took it out on the roof of the dugout where he started pounding his fist into the ceiling. Um, and then there was I was watching the, the Yankees Blue Jays game that they eventually won on Sunday, and like Judge got hit with a pitch. And the first one out of the dugout, all upset, was Garrett Cole, who had to be, like, held back. And there was nobody else remotely as angry as he was. And everybody was kind of confused, like, why? Like, it was an obvious accident. It was a fastball that hit Judge on the on the elbow pad. And Garrett Cole's acting like it was, like, personally, a vic- he's a personalized victim of that. I was like, that's, that's just, just angry for no reason. So you could tell it's starting to boil over. But that victory on Sunday and the victory on Monday gave them back-to-back wins for the first time all month. So... Uh, things are trending in the right direction. That series is tied with the Mets right now when we're taping this. Uh, so, but yeah, it's the, there's a couple of things with this Yankees slide that I thought were interesting. The, the trades they made this deadline have not paid off at all. The Frankie Montas trade, he's, he's pitched to a 9 ERA through three starts as a Yankee. And then Jordan Montgomery, who they traded uh, to the Cardinals for Harrison Bader, he's 3-0 and with a .54 ERA. So... Uh, they they look they appear to have been on the losing end of two big trades and you can't really afford to be messing around when you when you're talking about starting pitching I feel like come playoff time. Yeah, I we'll have to see how Bader helps that team when he when he comes back for sure. But right now, you're absolutely right. Um, they they needed a defensive center fielder, so you got to trade a good player to get to get a good player. Montgomery's been awesome. They're good for him. Uh, you know, it's it seems like the Yankees are are pretty over having 
Aaron Hicks in the lineup every day. So that's it seems like that was that move right there for uh for Bader. But like you said, he's hurt, so we gotta wait to see what happens when he comes back. But yeah, that's uh you never know, man. There's still a lot of time and, and I, I think Boone is right in the sense that he he keeps saying kind of like none of this matters. Like at the end of the season, if we're not the World Series champions, or like that's the only thing that matters. <clears throat> if we win, if we win at all, everything's great. If we don't, then it fucking doesn't matter anyway because we didn't win at all. So I, if in New York, and when you have a team that's played this well, I absolutely agree with with what he's saying there. So I went back and looked at Montgomery's stats and in the three and zero, the point five four. That was before. On the 22nd, he pitched a complete game, one hit shutout against the Cubs. So uh, he just added insult to injury there if you're a Yankees fan watching Montgomery ball out like that. Um, but I think they're putting a lot of pressure on Giancarlo Stanton's return. That's all I keep hearing about. It's like, oh, things will turn a corner once we get Stanton back. And maybe it will, but they also have a lot of guys that didn't realize how many injuries they had. So they, they're they they're down. Miguel Castro, Scott Efros, Clay Holmes, and Michael King. Um, so their bullpen is just completely like all messed up. And then LeMayhew and then Rizzo have been hurt for a little bit. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's start it's kind of telling that these things are starting to rear their ugly head in August, where it's like come playoff time, if if they get matched up with like the Astros who have their number or any of these other teams in the AL, I don't feel remotely confident about this Yankees team. And I think their fans don't either. Yeah, the the Michael King injury really hurt them earlier this year. He was being uh he was dominant out of the pen for them so that definitely was a blow and no you're right they um the Astros man have their number and that's no secret so yeah I think especially if Astros have on field advantage there that's a that's a series that makes any Yankees fan nervous um aside from that though I mean yeah I guess the Rays or the the Blue Jays maybe make you nervous but if I'm them I'd feel pretty good about playing anybody like minus the Astros. I'd feel pretty good about playing anybody else. You know, I, they're still, you know, judges still judge if they're, if they're healthy and they're playing in Yankee stadium, I, I think they're, you know, they're going to beat most teams, but the Astros are scary. And like you said, they need to win. Like they need to win. That's the only, <laughs> there's, there's no feel good about it. Yeah, which is you know very tough. Yeah, no doubt. So that was. I'm just again the AL East. I'm just so surprised that there hasn't been a team that really. Hit. I know you said that they had a 15 and a half game at lead at one point. So th- there was that big gap. But then all, all this month in it, losing in the month of August, and I'm like, really, Tampa's the closest, and they're eight. They're eight. They're still eight back. Tampa, know. Tampa had some injuries too, and they're getting guys back. So okay, could be. Uh, you know, Petey Fairbanks, our boy, has been throwing the absolute shit out of the baseball. So, and they're getting – Franco's still hurt. Yeah. They just got Margot back. They just got Harold Ramirez back, who's been huge for that lineup this year too. So, they, they're they definitely getting some guys back for the for that push. Brandon Lau was hurt for a lot of, for a lot of the season. So, the Rays are – you know, the Rays are always just right there. So, we'll see. We'll see what happens down the stretch. But I, man, if if anybody catches the Yankees, to if the Yankees are gonna be in the playoffs, but if anybody, if one of those teams catch them for the division, oh man, that's gonna be people are gonna be going crazy about that collapse. I can't wait. It's one of my favorite storylines to follow. The other storyline that I love in Major League Baseball right now is Albert Pujols' chase for 700 home runs. So the 42-year-old Albert Pujols has really picked up the pace in it. In his last seven games, he has four home runs, and he has 10 home runs in his last 30. He has 14 total, already exceeding last year's total with 41 games left. Um, so he had a home run against the Cubs the other night, and that gave him 693 total. He's three short of A-Rod for fourth all-time, but he really wants to get to that 700 plateau. We got, Like I said, 41 games left. Been, the, the bat has been hot as of late. What do, what do you think for Albert's chances here? It's, it's very close because I still don't think he's going to play in all those games. I don't think he's going to get, you know, regular bats. So 
Um, the opportunities won't be as great, but man, he's been swinging it so good, looking like him. You know, old vintage Albert Pujols there. It's it's been fun to watch. My question, I think he's going to be just short, like just short, like six ninety eight or something. And my question then is, he's having such a productive year, and he's that close to seven hundred. Are you going to retire? Or are you going to try to come back for one more season? But you already said you retire. Like you already have everything going, you know. So that'll just be really interesting if that happens. For his sake, I hope he gets seven hundred because then maybe he's he's like, okay, it's you know we're good. But I'm sure he's probably thinking like, shit, man, I'm swinging it pretty good. I'm being productive. We're we're a good team. I'm back in St. Louis. You know the DH is around. Maybe I could maybe I could go one one more year. I I don't know. I don't think he can go one more year in the field, but he can swing the bat for another year. I bet. That's such a great point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it'd be like a Bernie Mac, Mr. 3000 situation. <laughs> Just come back out of retirement, maybe. Because he he's mashing the ball against left-handed pitching this season. I think I looked and he's batting like 393 against lefties this year. It's like, yeah, it's almost 400. So he he still knows what he's doing with a bat when there's a lefty on the mound and he can DH. But that's that would be that would that would be bad for baseball if he retired after the end of the season with like 698 or 699. Like it's look, he's not going to catch Babe Ruth for third all time with seven fourteen. But I mean, after all the, the stuff this guy's had to endure, all those seasons in L, in L.A., the injuries, playing for all this time, for him to retire with short of seven hundred, that he would be doing the game a disservice. So uh, let's hope he gets it this year. But yes, after the end of the season, I would love to hear his quotes on how retired are you? Like you said, you're retired now, but like, is that like a firm one or? You know, we flexible with that. Maybe like a month, maybe give him the month of April to try. Yeah, I don't know. Just let's get weird with it. I want him to get 700. I agree. I would like, I, if it was me, I'd be like, nope, I gotta get, I can't leave on 698. Can't happen. After all of that, after all those, his career, yeah, it would just be, I don't think he would do that. I don't think he would leave on 699 because that would just be, you know, you, you can't, we can't walk off into the sunset after that. No, and I'm sure, listen, I'm sure he's tired. Like, his body's probably tired, and he doesn't feel great every day because he's been doing this for so damn long. But I feel like being back in St. Louis, one, and two, being with that team, you know, with Arenado, Gold, Goldschmidt's been, like, the best player in baseball. Your MVP. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're a good team. I feel like it just brings more energy, and it's it's more fun, and – it's just like all full circle for him. So I don't know. I could see him being like, man, you know, we got these guys are going to be here next year too. Maybe, maybe we can do one more year if I, if he finishes really strong, like he, like he's been. So I, I it, that's going to be very interesting. Although his boys are retiring, I believe too. Right. Yeah. This is Yachty and Wainwright. Yeah. Which, you know, I didn't realize how old Yadier Molina was, but yeah, he's he's up there, and, and Wainwright's still shoving on the mound. So yeah, it's for all those guys to walk away at the same time as productive as they are. I don't know. I don't buy that. Somebody's coming back. One of the three will we'll come see. back. Okay, there, there's the take. Clip it. Yeah, there's the there's hot my take. take. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up for you guys, uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. So there was a big press conference today. AJ Preller was there by his side in the dugout. Uh, Tatis has elected to go un- has elected to undergo surgery to repair the torn labrum uh, in his left shoulder, I think. Um, so it's and it's it's kind of a big deal. I forgot about this shoulder injury. Obviously buried with you know the the wrist injury in the off season. That we talk about the steroid suspension. I feel like a lot of people are probably in my camp are like, oh shit, wait, there was a shoulder too. Um, just because he was so close to coming back, and I think you had said it had been kind of nagging him for a little bit. Um, so. Dan, uh, Dan O'Dowd, I was watching MLB Network earlier, and they were talking about Tatis, and Dan O'Dowd was a general manager for the Rockies for so many years, and he said they didn't have a lot of success with guys who had that labrum surgery. He said it took 18 to 24 months for a player to begin to feel right again, which, you know, the, the Padres said that Tatis will be ready to come back when his suspension ends next year. Um, wh- how familiar are you with that kind of labrum injury? Does that does 18, 24 months sound right? You, you mentioned Bellinger had uh, that same kind of injury there. Yeah, I don't know exactly what it is, but with Toddy, it was 
it happened a few times last year and I guess throughout his like baseball life, not just in the pros, but uh, it just kind of like pops in and out like dislocates basically. And it's sometimes it's literally he did it and was playing two days later again. Uh, and there were other times where it, it took longer to, to do it. So they wanted, I believe the Padres wanted him to get the surgery at the end of this, after last season and Toddy didn't want to do that. So now um, like I, that's what O'Dowd said. Uh, I believe it's basically the same thing that Bellinger had done. And Bellinger, whether this is the reason or not, we don't know, but hasn't been the MVP caliber hitter that he was before this. Maybe that's maybe that's the reason, maybe it's not. So I think that's what gave Toddy some hesitation about it and that he could just kind of manage it and, and be fine. But I think – you know, they we've heard them, <clears throat> the Padres people kind of say we got to regain trust and things like that. And this might have been one way where they were like, hey, you know, you get the surgery done. Well, you know, you can show us that you mean it or whatever. And that's uh, maybe what's happening. Or maybe they're like, it's just a good time because you, you have the time to recover. And now you're not going to miss any games or whatever. So hopefully I'm – I'm not worried about him. I think he'll bounce right back and, and that he'll be fine doing that. Uh, it's his lead shoulder. So Bellinger's a lefty. So maybe there's a difference there, but yeah, I, I was, I woke up saying this today. I was pretty surprised by it, but it also makes sense. And I think, yeah, I think it's going to help put a little more faith into that relationship. It's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I, I was watching that press conference, and I, I one quote really stood out to me from Tatis' his, his statement there. He said, quote, I have seen my dreams turn into my worst nightmares in a couple days, a couple months. There's no one to blame other than myself. I made a mistake. Like, that's some deep, heavy, like, he, he could tell he was fighting back tears the entire time he was, he was talking there. Um, and then Preller had said that he also had a conversation with Tatis about maturity moving forward. Um, Tatis also had a, a players-only meeting with players from the Padres, uh, Joe Musgrove was asked about that conversation. He said there was a lot of tough love in those conversations behind closed doors, but that people make mistakes, which I thought was, you know, I, I think that's that pretty much sums up. I hope everybody's feeling on this. Like, yeah, the guy made a mistake. He's got to learn from it, but, you know, he's human. Um, do you think Tatis will come out better from all of this? Yeah, I do. Uh, going back to the first point, you know, every – first of all, Tati is, I mean – I think I said this on here before. I, all my interactions with him have been nothing but great. He's a super nice kid. He's he's been nothing but great to me. I don't have anything bad to say about Toddy. Um, the everywhere we went last year, like not just San Diego, on the road, like when he was playing or he was hitting or in the dugout, like anything, all you hear is people or kids or any, like just screaming Tatis, Tatis. And, you know, everybody loved them. So I'm sure for him now, like it's been an adjustment since this happened to kind of be like this villain and not this universally loved baseball player anymore. So I'm sure – all the things he's saying, like that you said, how deep, like he's probably been really struggling with this. I fully believe that. Um, not taking away, you know, any blame from himself, but it just kind of comes with it. And Preller, you know, I'm sure <laughs> Siri said, listen, dude, you gotta, we can't have anything else. Like, this is it. Like, you, we need you on the field. If you get hurt on the field playing, then something, you know, unfortunately happens that that is what it is, but no more off the field issues. We need you leading this team or helping lead this team and, and try to win a world series. And I'm sure that's what uh, his teammates said. I'm sure. First of all, that's great. He needed to do that. I I'm, didn't know when it was going to come, but yeah, he needed to sit there and talk to those guys for sure. Um, 
so that was that was definitely a big step in it. And yeah, they're you know they're they're pissed because he's such a good player and that they know they can use him to to help them where they you know, get where they want to get to. So it needed to be done. I'm sure everybody feels better about it now. I'm sure it was bothering Toddy not talking to all of them either. Those are you know they're still your boys even though they're mad at you. Like it's a it's a weird situation to have to go into and, and talk about, but needed to be done. I think it's nothing knock on wood, nothing worse should happen in his career than what's happening right now. So he gets through this, he gets back on the field and, and he's himself and just plays like he is, everything's going to go back to normal as Yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's all, all great points there. I wanted to stick in the NL West for uh, the last news item, and that is, of course, the electric debut for Dustin May, the, the Dodgers starting pitcher, who made his first start in 475 days since Tommy John surgery. Five scoreless innings, nine strikeouts, only one walk and one hit against the Marlins. This guy, I mean, he's true to form. His sinker was 98.8, and then his four-seamer maxed out at 99.2. So uh, that's it, it. Just it just blows my mind watching this guy pitch. First of all, I didn't realize how skinny he was. He is rail thin, and he just is able to put everything on all of his pitches. Um, I know people talk about Jacob Degrom having the best stuff, and rightfully so. The velocity, all the stuff. But I'm gonna go out on a limb. I'm gonna put my hot take hat on, and I'm gonna say that Dustin May has the best pure stuff in all of baseball. Tell me why I'm wrong. He's his shit is gross. I mean, it's legit. Like you said, he he's got that whip. He's got that look the uh, the ground like whip with his arm. Um, he's long and yeah, I that's dude. His stuff, his stuff is nasty. I mean, he he definitely could have the best pure stuff in the major leagues. I'm I'm not gonna like fight you on that. It's uh. <laughs> It's legit. It, it's moving all over the place, and it's coming in hard. And I remember seeing he threw him an immaculate inning in his in what I think it was his last rehab start in AAA. So uh, he's good, man. And that's it, they need him now, especially uh, with the news about Walker Bueller. Yeah, I mean, and I'll get to that in a second. I, I look back, and do you remember in 2020 when he was going against Machado and he threw a 99 mile an hour two seamer? Pitching Ninja loved it. It went viral. It had like a million views on Twitter. It had two feet of movement and it like went from like the middle of the plate to behind him to like behind his back leg. And it was just the nastiest pitch I think I've ever seen in my entire life. And that's what, that's just what this guy does on a regular basis. Like that's not any kind of rarity for him. Um, I, I think we need to appreciate how good Dustin May is because he, with a full season of 30 plus starts, he, he'll break, he'll break every record there is. He's, he's unhittable. I love – I'm going to hitch my wagon to Dustin May. Uh, it's probably not even a hot take, but uh, I, I'm a big, big fan of the guy with the giant red afro. So, um, electric. Yeah, well, if, if hitters just don't try to hit homers or not strike out, then they'll be fine. So, we'll see what, we'll see what happens. You go up there thinking you're going to hit a homer against Dustin May, you're going to look like an idiot, and that's a fact. <laughs> we, don't need, we don't need MLB Network to break that one down. Um, yep. so you mentioned the Dodgers rotation and you're right because with Walker Bueller going down with Tommy John surgery, I'm looking at that depth of that rotation. So here are your healthy Dodgers starters, Julio Urias, Tony Gonsolin, who's been a revelation this year, Tyler Anderson, another revelation, Andrew Heaney, and then Dustin May. Is that good enough to, is that going to match up well with, with other teams aces come playoff time? You think? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, Arias is, is really good. Gonsolin, like you said, has been having an unbelievable year. Same with uh, Tyler Anderson; has been phenomenal this year too. And then, and then you throw May in there, or if you go just three. But I uh, do. They just I, they just win. I don't know. They just, they're like the Astros. Like no matter what, I know their lineup's great, but they just like no matter what, they're just winning. It's you think something's gonna happen, and it's like no, nah, Dodgers still win. So, um, yeah, I, I believe in, I believe in the Dodgers and that they're in a playoff series right now. 
I don't know if there'd be any, I maybe the Mets. I think I would probably favor the Dodgers in, in any series or they, they would be my pick to win. Right. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, I would probably lean that way too. I think a Dodgers Mets and LCS would be one of the best of all time, especially this year. Um, but I just, I don't know. I don't know if there's enough veteran, like that's what, that's why they had Scherzer. Cause they're like, we need a guy in this rotation that's been there, done that. And you know, all these guys are good, but I don't know. I, I think they're really hoping for Clayton Kershaw to come back to kind of anchor that with just pure experience, you know, bulldog mentality. But yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch them come playoff time and, and who, how they decide to go about the rotation. Cause Dave Roberts loves to tinker with that kind of stuff. Um, who goes to the bullpen? who who doesn't so um yeah that's it's it's actually it's a lot deeper now that i then like before I, when i was making this list i'm like you know it doesn't really seem that deep and now that we're talking about it i'm like yeah especially with dustin may i mean that guy yeah he, he changes but, the whole dynamic yeah you know, the thing with with me and the mets this year why i picked them at the beginning of the year you're i mean i'm going to Scherzer and DeGrom four times in a series, you know, I'm going to take my chances. I know Scherzer just lost to the Yankees, but uh, it's, they're just so good. I, it's it's tough to bet against them. Now the Mets have to score a run against whoever they're, you know, playing against, play against but best of seven series, man. And you get that, those guys going four times. I probably, yeah. I probably lean towards the Mets there. This, this playoffs could be probably one of the best in, in recent memory, just all the storylines yeah. and all these guys on these super teams that we have, it's going to be electric. Um, that's awesome. All right. We have a couple last, last things for you guys. Uh, I have probably my favorite fudging awesome moment of the week. Fudging awesome moment of the week is brought to you by our sponsor, the original fudge kitchen. You can find them at fudge kitchens with an S.com. The ship sweet treats and fudge all over the country. I can't wait to come back home and get some for our Philly Jersey shore listeners. As the summer is winding down, I know you guys are getting sad. You can't be down the shore anymore, but if you're still down there, they have locations in ocean city, stone Harbor, wildwood, North wildwood, Cape may go in there, check them out. That's the original fudge kitchen. They ship all over the country. You can order at Fudge Kitchens with an S.com. I, I put a lot of hype into this, this Fudge and Awesome Moment of the Week, and for good reason. Uh, it's probably, it's a story that I don't know if a lot of people have heard about, but it's amazing. So Stone Garrett is an outfielder for the Arizona Diamondbacks. He made his major league debut on August 17th, completing an eight-year journey in the minor leagues. So uh, on his major league debut, he got his first hit that night. It was an RBI double. But the crazy part about all of this is that that none of this, like it almost didn't happen. So he was drafted actually in the same round and same year as Brian in 2014 in the eighth round. So shout out by the Miami Marlins. Um, During the 2020 COVID pandemic, he was released. And so he, you know, he was trying to figure out what he was going to do with his life. He had in off seasons in the past, he had gone out and gotten his real estate license so he was thinking like, all right, maybe that's, maybe that's going to be my career. Maybe baseball's done. And then there's a little part of him that's like, you know what? I think I still have something left to give the game. So he's about to delete his LinkedIn profile. But then, uh, so he uh, ran into um, uh, an old video coordinator in the Gulf Coast League who checked in and was like, hey, congrats on the real estate stuff. They talked. Garrett was like, hey, do you know of any teams that need an outfielder that can, I can play like double A or better? And then two days after they talked, he was signed to a spring training deal with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, and then, you know, two solid seasons of great power in double A AA and triple A. He was called up, made his major league debut. All goes to show, uh, you never know, like, how something's going to turn out, like, especially with networking, and it's all about people and who, who you know and how you can kind of leverage that to help you. And then also just shout out LinkedIn. You, you never know uh, what being on LinkedIn uh, is, is going to do for you in your career. But how awesome is that? Have you ever heard anything like that? There's a, uh, the one that the, another similar story. I forget the guy's name. He's a pitcher. Uh, just happened though too. Same thing. He was like working in finance out of baseball and then he made his debut of like two days ago or something. So man, the pandemic thing hurt a lot of guys. Um, you know, fortunately some of these guys stuck it out and that's awesome. Good for, good for stone. What a great story. 
shout out to whoever that guy was you talked to who got him, <laughs> who knew the Diamondbacks needed an outfielder. Uh, but yeah, man, that's what a great story. Good moment. Yeah, it's it's so cool. Yeah, and just shout yeah again shout out LinkedIn. It's I, it's so it's so crazy that like sometimes you see athletes on there like established athletes and it's like why why is this guy on LinkedIn? And then you you realize that, like you know it could actually help some guys. So um, for anybody out there, go out there make sure your LinkedIn's up to date. Make sure you get that profile picture updated because it'll it'll help you out there in your career. You never know how. Um, all right, uh, we have two top fives for this week, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, for the uh, Breaking Bats top five. So I went back, and I'm ashamed to admit, but Brian won last week's, uh, we have to clean up last week's, Brian won the top five for uh, Closer Entrance songs. I thought I had you, dude. I thought I had you dead to rights, and then I look, and then, yeah, you won 54 to 46. So Blow uh, out. Congrats. Yeah. Blow out. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I, we, it's so funny. We put these both on TikTok as, like, individual clips, and like yours got like seventy thousand views or something, and I got like two thousand. Yeah, you have you have seventy five thousand views on yours, and I have sixteen hundred on mine. And people loved big fans of Mark the Sharks uh, Thunderstruck. So just you got to use some it. better hashtags or something on yours, man. Come on, we gotta <laughs> we gotta pump that out there more. What's going on? I don't know. They just they loved. Uh, they, they a lot of people were like, you know what, Mark the Shark, big fan. So he's got a, it was, he's got a big, it was a good one. He's got a big following on, on TikTok. Uh, but this week <laughs> in uh, our top five, we're going to be doing the top five Albert Pujols moments of his career. So we just talked earlier about his chase for 700. Uh, th- this guy, he's been one of my favorite players growing up. I think every kid in the backyard tries to emulate his batting stance. So uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to do these for top five Albert Pujols career moments. I'll start us off with number five. I'm going 2011 World Series Game 3. That's when Pujols went 5 for 6 with 6 RBIs and 3 home runs. Uh, I went back and I watched the highlight, and that first one, Joe Buck said, quote, that ball is absolutely murdered. (laughs) I don't remember a home run ever being described like that, Uh, but shout out Joe Buck. And those 3 home runs in a World Series at the time, only Babe Ruth and Reggie Jackson had done that. So uh, that that was a big, big moment back in 2011. Number four, I have 2022 opening day and his return to Bush Stadium as a Cardinal. He obviously spent 10 years out in LA with the Angels and then with the with the Dodgers there at the end there. And for him to come back, you know, shout out to CBA and the, and the Universal DH because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have Albert back in in St. Louis this year. So uh, it's it's been awesome watching him back uh, in St. Louis where it all started. So that's number four. Number three, I have the 600 home run club. In June of 2017, he became the first player to ever hit 600 home runs with the 600th being a grand slam. So uh, just mashing the ball back into Anaheim. Number two, I have the 2022 home run derby and the upset of Kyle Schwarber uh, and also the the heartfelt moment on the field there with everybody kind of gave him a hug. So uh, kind of recency bias, but I mean, I think all things considered, that was pretty cool for, for a great send-off there. And then last but not least, my number one Albert Pujols moment is the 2005 NLCS home run where Brad Lidge pitched batting practice to him and he hit it onto the train tracks at Minute Maid. Uh, it was, I don't think that ball has landed yet. And uh, I went back and I was like, damn, I, I, it's been so long. I remember watching that as a kid and that game forced a game six, but obviously, you know, the Cardinals didn't, they didn't win that game, but um, a great moment nonetheless. Those are all good ones. I, I have a feeling that you're going to beat me this week because you got first, first try there. So people are going to hear yours before mine, but with mine, you know, number five, kind of like the World Series game. Uh, in 2004, he went five for five against the Cubs with three homers, including the game winner in the ninth off Latroy Hawkins. So that was number five. Three homers in a game, a lot of fun. Good for him. Three homers in a World Series game, more fun though. But anyway, uh, number four, 3,000 hits, man. In 2018, he got his 3,000th hit. That's a lot of hits. That's a lot of fun. Way better than outs. Hits are way cooler. So 3,000 hits, definitely a huge accomplishment aside from the the power stuff. Uh, number three is going to be winning the uh, 06 World Series with the Cardinals. Uh, I'm sure if you talk to Albert, he probably put that up there with uh, his accomplishments. Winning the World Series like that, bringing, a, <clears throat> bringing that to St. Louis, just, uh, just awesome. Uh, number two, 
six hundred home runs. God, it's it's just I know it's the grand slam, but it's just so many homers. Six hundred is just it's just so many homers. Like, good for him. That has to be that has to be fun. Six hundred times you ran around the bases like that. Well, more than that now, but anyway, number one. It's it's the Lidge Homer. That's like I just feel like it's such an iconic moment. I know you you spoiled it and said that they didn't end up winning, but it was I don't know, that ball's hit so far, so hard. Like just the whole Lidge was so good. Like it's just the whole thing, the whole situation, and just it was awesome. Like, yeah, I think I think a lot of people when you talk about our pool holes go to that moment. And that swing, and yeah, that's uh, to me that's number one. And yeah, I I'll never I'll never forget that that homer. If I remember correctly, I think that was he was the last batter of the game, and like they were like the the Astros were one out away from a world going to the World Series, which they eventually did. Um, and then yeah, to have Pujols come up there with two guys on with, and with two outs in, a, in an NLCS big moment like that, uh, he broke Brad Lidge. I don't think Brad Lidge was ever quite the same closer. Uh, I know he had a – he was a good for the Phillies there for a little bit, but um, – Great for the Phillies. Yeah. <laughs> World Series, baby. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, yeah, that's – he just – he broke Brad Lidge. So, um, that's that's probably a lot of people's number one Albert Pujols moment. Um, I think so. So, cool. And then, last but not least this week, we have the Not For Long Media Top 5. So, each week across all Not For Long Media podcasts, we will be ranking – uh, our top fives and then putting them out on graphics to, to let the world decide. Um, last week we did Gatorade this week. Uh, this one was chosen by producer extraordinaire, Jack Connell, who chose public transportation as our top five. So, you know, they can't be all, they can't all be first round picks. Um, no, I mean, Jack, we, if you listen to Colin, the, the Colin Thompson show, Colin just rips into Jack every single week. It is, it is very, very funny. But uh, nonetheless, we have our top five modes of public transportation. I will start with number five, the bird scooter. It's If your city doesn't have one, I feel bad for you because whipping those things around is so much fun. It's really cheap, and yeah, it's people have a lot of fun with those if you see those on TikTok. I watched the guy ride one directly into the, the Tampa Bay one time, just rode it off a dock into the Tampa Bay. So uh, I love... I love bird scooters. <laughs> uh, number four, I have the Metro. Uh, if you're a DMV guy like myself, if you take the Metro into DC, it is awesome. I did that over the weekend to go into the Smithsonian. It's just perfect. It's cheap. On the weekends, it's free to park there. And then you just ride around the entire city of DC and the surrounding area for like $2. So big Metro guy. Number three, I have an Uber. It'll save your life at 2 a.m. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the surge pricing that they do where they quadruple the prices when everybody leaves the bar. Uh, but nonetheless, I think I think a lot of people have been saved by an Uber a time or two. So got to put it in there. Number two, I have a boat or a ferry, just all encompassing. If you do the Kate May Lewis ferry, that's you know that's that's awesome. You can hang out and chill. Uh, or if you're just you know zooming around, like in Pittsburgh, they have like boat tours and stuff. So it's a fun way to get around. If you're not by any water, I feel bad for you. Last but not least, I have a plane. It could be any plane. It could be a it could be a private jet if you got a little coin. It could be, you know, a Southwest. It could be sitting middle seat. It's, it, you know, it, there's nothing like it. So uh, I, if you're like me and you forget to check in to your flight the day before on Southwest and you have to get like boarding group C position 60 and you're sitting in the men's room, it's not great. But, you know, just figure it out. It, the plane's the best. Oh, my God. That's that's tough. You gotta You can't forget to check in on Southwest, kid. Come on. I did it the every metro. time. And then there's the panic, <laughs> the panic when you go to check in and like the day of, and then you're like, dear God, let me get boarding group B at least. And it's like, nobody C60 yeah. back. That's tough, man. That's tough living right there. You gotta, you gotta be better. Sorry. What a great list though. Mine, mine probably better. Probably not going to win. Number five. Bird scooter. The bird scooter is phenomenal. You're right. That thing whips around the city, although it's pretty dangerous too. I will say I've definitely seen some people eat it yep. on that thing. I have not personally done it, but I feel like I've been close. I remember we were in Columbus. Sorry, Lucas Sims, Reds relief pitcher. Uh, we were, I was in a car and we were driving to the stadium and it was like four of us in there and old Lucas was taken a, a bird scooter and in an intersection <laughs> the, I'm not kidding. 
in the intersection. We're driving by him. He's, he's, he's going. The thing just like broke. It just like collapsed as he was going. Like, I swear, it just broke into like four pieces. And he fell in the middle of the intersection. <laughs> Sorry, Sims. But uh, he was okay. He was okay. Yeah. The, I don't know. Had a malfunction. Thing just like imploded and Lucas fell off. I'll never forget that. That was really funny. Sorry, Lucas. And number four, plane. You know, when it's far, you got to get on a plane. I'm not a huge plane guy. I don't like being in a, in a tube way above the ground for some reason. But, uh, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I'll take one back to America here pretty soon. Number three, Uber. Same thing. Uber. Uber's the best. It's also the worst. You get those surge charges. Those do suck. But, man, I don't know what anybody did before Uber. So they took taxis, I guess, which just couldn't have been as convenient. But whatever. And then my number two and my number one are more specific to Japan than they are America. America should figure this out. The number two is is the local train here in Japan. Get you wherever. It's like two bucks. Same thing. It's great. Uh, so I get to and from the stadium every day eh, for the most part. But then number one is the bullet train in Japan, which goes very fast, gets you where you're going much more quickly. It's very spacious. It's it's good. I I it's my preferred mode of transportation here in Japan. If America could do this, it would be great. It would be a nice you to get to Philly would be a nice like one hour ride. You just be hanging out and it's just really convenient and easy. And there's not, you know, you don't have to go through uh airport security and all those kind of things so thank you jack for making me think about my my favorite modes of public transportation and those are my five young sung hero yeah the bullet train also a great movie with brad pitt so um, <laughs> you know that, that might yep. be an added bonus yeah just you never know uh yeah an interesting top five but yeah let's we'll see what producer jack cooks up for next week it'll probably be like top <laughs> top five uh you know ways to cut your grass or something i don't know it would just be so <laughs> off the wall <laughs> just i don't know um but oh, at any rate uh, a lot of stuff this week but we also have a great interview coming up with two sport legend josh booty uh drafted he was the opening day starter for the for the florida marlins back in the day went to lsu to play college football and was even drafted in the nfl uh brian i think you said in there that you're an aspiring college football analyst uh so how much fun was i getting to chop it up with booty for a little bit Man, it was it was so much fun. It was it's fun because it was a little different too. I'm mean, like I said, I'm a huge college football fan, huge football fan in general. So it was cool to talk to him about that. Also, a de facto LSU kind of fan. So it was cool to hear some stories about LSU. But man, what a, it, his stories were great. The stories he would tell, like I was not expecting them to be as good as they were. Uh, the Kevin Millar story is phenomenal. Well, you guys got to listen for that. There's it. He's just a funny dude. He was, he was great. Uh, he actually texted me last night. It was cool to talk to him again. He's uh he's a cool dude. What a great athlete. Obviously not many, many people can play in the MLB and the NFL. Uh, so it was just a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, with, uh, with all that being said, let's, uh, let's go to our interview with Josh Booty. Today, joining us on breaking bats, we have former MLB player and NFL player Josh Booty. Josh was the fifth overall pick coming out of high school. Later went back to LSU, played under Nick Saban, and then was drafted to the NFL after that, after making it to the major leagues, which is unbelievable. I don't know how many people on planet Earth can can say that they did that. Um and it's something that I think is really cool because I've always uh, kind of advocated for kids to play as many sports as they enjoy and not focus on just one. So I think aside from an unbelievable athletic feat, what Josh did, I think it's awesome that he can be a multi-sport guy that, that we can talk to here. So Josh, thank you for, for coming on. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, how's everything going? How you doing, man? I'm doing wonderful, man. I appreciate you guys having me and, you know, it's football season's just around the corner. Couldn't be more about it, man. It's just like 
when football comes around. I'm my dad's a football coach. My family's big football. I played baseball too, but football season is so much fun and watching LSU and we got a new coach, Brian Kelly. So uh, you know, my brother played at USC and they got a new coach in Lincoln Riley. I got my nephews at Oklahoma. He's gonna be a backup quarterback for the Sooners. And I've got twin boys that play high school football. So it's like football season is just so much fun. Man, that is a lot right there. And I agree with you. Even though I'm a baseball guy and I'm out here still playing baseball, there's <laughs> nothing, nothing like, like football season, man. I, I, it's just the best. It's, uh, you know, for me growing up in Philly, it was, I love the weather that it brought too. that fall weather up there is the best. So yep. there was nothing like Saturday mornings sitting there with my dad on the couch watching, you know, all the college football games. Uh, I love it. I can't wait. My wife will tell you Saturdays are those days are off limits for me. I'm sitting on the couch, I'm eating some food and I'm watching every game. Uh, so I, I'm with you, man. I can't wait. I'm kind of a de facto, de facto LSU fan for some reason. Don't really know how it happened, but I really, uh, I really enjoy watching the Tigers. I really enjoy rooting for the Tigers now. And, uh, Awesome. You know, hopefully one day in my, in my brain, you know, if, if I'm lucky enough to have a son, I hope he goes to LSU is where I want to go so I can go hang out and enjoy it too. So hopefully that happens. I hope he plays quarterback. Maybe he's in Joe Burrow, man. I, you know, we've, had, we've had so many great athletes come through there, and now we're, you know, the last few years have been tough. We lost a lot the year after we won the national championship with all those guys uh, with Burrow leading the charge. But I think Brian Kelly's the great game day coach. It's going to be fun to watch him. And, uh, you know, if you grew up in Louisiana, it's like, I guess in Pennsylvania, it's probably Penn State. You know, everybody loves yeah. Penn State, Ohio, Ohio State. You know, in, in, in Louisiana, we are the only big time uh, college football program. There's some smaller ones that are making some waves. Uh, ULL's playing great. Louisiana Tech always is okay. Tulane's okay. But LSU is people, you know, they they eat, sleep, and breathe, and they're purple and gold, man. So I could see why, you know, a guy from the outside looking in and, and watching like a Saturday night game in, in Tiger Stadium, it is a uh, electric. And I uh, was glad that I could be a part of it. But what a wonderful, wonderful place or setting for a college football game. Yeah, it definitely seems like I'd love to go out there and just check out a game and take it all in. Yeah, Penn State. I grew up Penn State fan. Uh, I went to Rutgers University in New Jersey, which, you yeah. know, football, uh, they got a decent football team, but it's just uh, I've been to Penn State games. It's not the same. I've obviously been to Rutgers games. It's not the same as Penn State, and uh, Penn State's a great time, but something tells me LSU or a big-time SEC game might be even a little bit different than that too, so – well, it is a lot of fun. I've, I've always wanted to go to the bucket list white, all white, the whiteout game at Penn State somewhere that I've always ever been to a game. Paterno even recruited me back in the day. And I always had kind of, you know, I love college football. So any of the big atmospheres, you know, the swamp and the horseshoe and, uh, you know, the Coliseum or, you know, where Texas plays the Longhorn, you know, it's, it's, it's just like those places are like cathedrals, you know, and, and it's uh, I've been to most of them. Uh, there's still some that I want to go to in Penn State, whatever. It's definitely a good time. It's definitely uh, it's definitely different. That whiteout is is unbelievable. Um, we could have just did a, a, an entire episode or two about college football. I, but I think I just one day like I would have like push away baseball and just become a college football analyst. I think is like my my next dream too. I love it. But uh, we'll let Jay yeah. hop in here. And <laughs> See what he's got. That's awesome, dude. I just want to say boomer sooner. So I'm really excited about your nephew, General. Uh, you know, uh, we'll right. probably have a question or two about him in a bit. But um, so going back to like the, the growing up playing multiple sports thing, Brian and I, we, we've talked to a lot of guys on this podcast about the value and just like how important it is for kids to, to grow up playing multiple sports. And, and Brian even mentioned it. Not a lot of those kids see multiple sports through. Uh, what did you like best about baseball and football when you were growing up? Um, but I like baseball probably more when I was younger um, until I got to high school. We, uh, you know, when you're when you're young and playing football, I was a quarterback, but you didn't throw the ball very much. It was a handoff game. You know, it was like, you know, I throw a, uh, you know, a play action pass to the tight end or a go ball, but you weren't throwing, 
no huddle spread 40 times a game, you know, that kind of fast action. And we did that in high school. But uh, so in high school, football became probably uh, something that really became forefront for me in terms of like what I was thinking I wanted to do with my life or career in sports. But early on, man, baseball, my dad was a, a slow pitch softball player, but a very high level and they traveled all the time, whatever tournaments. And if you could say slow pitch softball is high level, it, you know, they, these guys take it serious and they'll play tons and tons of tournaments. And I would travel with them and be their bat boy and shag flies and try to get a little BP at the end of the, their practices or whatever. And I, I just love being around it. And I think that gave me uh, a little bit of that baseball background that I needed to play well early um, in my high school career. I had an awesome high school baseball coach who was a triple A shortstop, played at Arizona State with Bonds. He he was there in Louisiana. He played double A through Shreveport, which was the Texas League um, organiz- a team at the time. Um, and he he – he was the shortstop, uh, you know, there in Shreveport. And then he became our head coach and in, in, at the high school. And he taught me everything he knew. And he was a really, really good player. He just wasn't a big leaguer, but he was a triple A AAA guy that hit 300 and just was awesome. So, um, you know, he taught me a lot. I've just paid attention to everything. I'm a detail oriented guy. And I love actually, you know, sun up to sundown. I was always doing something, whether I played basketball too in high school, I was a point guard. And, uh, started as a freshman, but my dad, he didn't want me really playing basketball past my junior year because he goes, we got to really now focus on uh, two sports. You know, most dads are like focus on one, but I was I was having a lot of success at the two ba- basketball, not so much just kind of a role player. But um, in football, we were breaking records um, in baseball. You know, I was uh, I was all state four years in a row like I. I played you know pretty darn well I guess at that level um and was on the USA junior national team with Alex Rodriguez he was my roommate and Paul Canerco some baseball names and uh, anyways we so that was after my junior year and I coming into my senior year I'm like man I know I'm gonna have to make a decision one of these days but LSU recruited me to play both so I was like dude they're coming off a national championship in baseball their football team wasn't as good but Skip Bertman, legendary coach at LSU, said, dude, if you sign here, you'll play shortstop next year, day one. Uh, and so I'm like, dude, I'm going to play shortstop, and I'm going to go play, try to play quarterback and win a job as a freshman. And then, of course, the draft happened, and I'm sure you'll want to talk about some of that. But early on in my career, it was baseball, Little League, and then when I got to high school, football was something that really kicked in and I thought was just an amazing sport to play. Wow, that's incredible, especially even talking about – balancing three sports like how did you kind of find time to you know de- how, like where did you find the time to dedicate to all of those and like did you find it challenging to to live a life outside of those games when you're in high school well my parents were awesome in terms of you know getting me places or being there or making sure uh you know we were at, we, we lived across the street from the high school and so I could ride my four-wheeler up to the field and take BP or hit in the cages or throw on the football field and um, you know, our, it just, we had amazing, it was a private school and it was small and, you know, it was just, I was kind of the guy there at the time it was a new school. And so they just pushed me and they're like, dude, you got the reins on everything. So I was kind of like one of the coaches, to be honest with you. And it was kind of like a Christian IMG. If you know what IMG is kind of, it was, it was focused on sports. Like everything was like in the morning when I went to school, it was like, School was important, but it wasn't like everything. And it was like sports was probably more important. And whether it was lifting or running or or stretching or training or throwing or hitting, it was like I was always doing something. And so it was just a natural fit, place, whatever sports season it was. And um, I loved it. And I knew that they they do help each other. I mean, if you really look at like Mahomes and Rodgers and even Brady was a catcher that got drafted. A lot of the guys were great baseball players. Burrow was a great basketball player. Tim Couch, who I played with for three years, was an all-state guy. Could have played basketball. Kentucky was the first pick overall. I mean, a lot of these great athletes, they, they have to decide one day. But when they're when they're young and they're in their teenage years, it's like they're getting skills that are developed through the different types of sports that are really going to help them in the long run. I mean, that's why Burrow is so elusive in the pocket. 
you know, because he's like a point guard. He's getting the ball out. Russell Wilson was a second baseman. I mean, so uh, there's just so many things that, and I've, I've talked to my, you know, uh, I've, I've talked about this millions of times, to be honest with you, with with players like Kyler Murray, Jameis Winston, guys that played two sports and and uh, have broken this thing down. But it helps to play two. My kids, my have twin boys, they play both baseball and football, and it really helps them, I think. Um, it's just hard now because kids that are like 8, 10 years old are playing like 80 games and travel ball in the summer, and they're like, that's more than SEC schedule, you know. So it's really, really hard these days for kids to try to do both unless they're ultra gifted. Yeah, there's um, – man, there's so much there. I love it. I, I played football, baseball, and basketball until high school, and then I cut it down. I cut football out and played just basketball and baseball in high school. I hated football practice, man. Love football. I couldn't stand practice. Couldn't stand. I'm like, you know what? I knew baseball was kind of my thing. Um, yeah. But I love the other ones, and I love the athleticism that they, you know, bring. So cut it down. But I'm with you, man. I love – I think it's great for any kid if they enjoy more than one sport to go do it because it just makes you a better athlete in general. And I definitely think football and then basketball, especially as I kept playing in high school, helped me to be a better athlete on the baseball field without a doubt. <clears throat> and man, it's just baseball, such a different set of skills like hitting. is just nothing. There's not, I mean, You've seen clips of you've seen clips of guys who are really good athletes trying to swing a bat, and it just uh, isn't very good. Like uh, Giannis from the Bucks, him trying to hit a ball off the tee. I don't know if you ever saw that. It's not not very pretty, and obviously that guy is very athletic, very athletic. But uh, there was man, base there was, got there was just a solo post ball taking BP here in, in Miami a while ago, like earlier in an, an hour ago while you were sleeping. That. Fan and he he ain't hit a ball yet in BP. And it's like he, I mean, he looks like he's karate chopping out there with the baseball bat. Terrible, but you, you're right. It's like it's so difficult. Like football, the difficult part of football is, you know, you got to be fearless. Uh, it, like quarterback. I mean, I'm in any position, but at quarterback, you got all these guys coming after you. You know, you got 11 guys on defense and they're coming at you. And it's like, how do you keep your eyes focused on everything around you? Situational football, compartmentalizing all this stuff that's happening, getting people in motion, snap count, play call, coverages, blitzes, looks, fronts, boom. It's all this stuff. In baseball, it's like, how am I going to hit this 95 mile hour fastball? This guy's got a three quarter arm slot, you know, and then, then to, you know, then they bring in a lefty that's throwing 10 miles an hour slower. And he's throwing from a different arm slot. And it's like every day, every day, every day, you don't even know where you're at when you wake up. You know this from playing. You don't even know, like, you're in the hotel room on the road. You wake up in the night, you got to take a leak. And you're like, I don't know where the bathroom is. You know, and where am I? You don't even know where you're at. Football, you kind of know where you're at, but you don't want to get knocked out. You know, so that's yeah. the difference. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so true because, yeah, it's – baseball is tough, man, because you just – no matter what, you're just you're not very good at it. Once you get to the, to a high level, you know, high school you can dominate, and in college you can be pretty good too. You get to the pros, and no matter how good you are, you're still like the the old cliche: you're still failing seven out of ten times. So it's not that fun. Um, football, I guess you're better at, but like you said, you got guys coming trying to take your head off. So that is not as not as fun there either. But I love it, man. That's that's so cool. It's uh. I don't know, man. I guess if I have one regret about my high school career, it's stopping playing football because I feel like high school football is just so much fun. It is. In in the South, too, it's just amazing. In Pennsylvania, you got – That's me, yeah. Got unreal leagues, uh, you know, Southern California, South Florida, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia. I mean, it's just Ohio, deep, deep-rooted high school football where it's like that is everything to a high school kid. And – we all know those powerful football states, but um, the energy, you know, the life, the fans, the cheerleaders, it's everything. You know, it's the pep rallies. It's the band. It's like my, my nephew, General, who you mentioned and I mentioned earlier, I mean, he played at Allen, Texas. They got a $60 million football facility. People in the band. I mean, it's just nasty. <laughs> it's like, I wish I could have you know, played in that environment. That's like, 
they got more people than an SMU game, you know? So it's like, I don't know, football is just that is so surreal if it's rocking, you know, and baseball is a patient man's game. It's a, it's kind of, you know, you hit the home run, people leave their seats, but until that home run, there's people are eating their hot dogs and drinking their beer and talking about what they're going to do tonight or tomorrow, or the next day, their business and all that football, man. It's just like the energy's, you know, is surreal. You, uh, you mentioned being drafted by the upstart Marlins fifth overall in 94. Um, how did that kind of like, what was your mindset like back in the day? So you said that you were recruited to play football by some people. You mentioned Joe Paterno, and then you get drafted by this team that has only existed for like a year at that point. Like, what was your mindset when you got taken then? Um, my agent, Jeff Morad, who was with Lee Steinberg and, and was an awesome, awesome agent for a long time. He was one of the first mega agents, him and Boris, but, um, you know, he positioned me fifth overall because they didn't have a lot of depth, uh, in the minor leagues because they were a new franchise and he knew for me to forego football, if I was to do that, I need to get drafted by a, a, a team that the guy had deep pockets. The Wayne Izinga was the owner at the time, but it also would allow me to go up the ladder pretty quickly. Uh, big league call-ups, big league camp, uh, stuff like that, that, uh, was, really something that meant a lot to me in the negotiation process to sign and, and for go football, to be honest with you. I didn't know if I'd ever play football again when I signed with the Marlins after getting drafted, uh, you know, in 94. I, I remember going back to my room. I, I got drafted and then it took about a month to, to negotiate the deal. But I remember when I, when I said, okay, I'm going to go play baseball for Marlins. I mean, I went back in my room and cried because I knew I was going to, you know, not be at LSU, not play quarterback, not play for Skip Bourbon. I love these people. They recruited me. I, they were like family. I'm a Louisiana boy. Uh, I was going to try to bring the, the, you know, the football program back or help it, uh, you know, as the USA Today Player of the Year. Um, you're, it's like the ESPN number one recruit. You know, you're the guy. And so I thought, you know, that was something I really wanted to do. And for me to forego that and go the baseball route, it was tough in the first probably month or so because, you know, I played at the end of the season minor leagues and then I go to instructional ball and all that. And it's like football. And, you know, I'm missing football and I want to be playing. So a month after I signed, you know, I thought I was going to be potentially in camp at LSU playing football and going to Tiger Stadium and playing games. And now I'm in instructional ball where there's 10 people watching. It was very tough in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, Brian. No, instru instructional league is is definitely not LSU football. That is that is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big difference, you know. It's a long. You get drafted yeah. like that, and then it's kind of a shock about like uh, the season, and then you go do that, and it just feels really long, and it's still hot, and it's just uh, not a lot going on. And yeah, you're probably sitting there, football starting to come on, and you're watching these games going shit, I could be playing in this shit instead of uh, out here on a backfield grinding in uh, whatever, November, October, whatever it is. Oh, you ain't kidding. I mean, and I was, you know, you you adjust to the wood bat. I'm the young kid on the, you know, young kid there. Uh, was a two or three sport guy, so I, I had to just concentrate on baseball. And now to be concentrating on baseball, wood bat, facing good pitchers, instructional ball, and not wanting to be there. Uh, because the football season probably, you know, at that point, I'm, I'm trying to think back of how I was probably feeling. Uh, you know, it was awesome to put on the Marlins uniform. Don't get me wrong. I loved it, and I knew I was working towards something. But at that same time, it was like football season was was so big in the South, and that's what I loved. And so, uh, you know, it just – it was taken away from me, but not taken away from me at the same time. I mean, I was, I was so – fired up about being a Marlin. I had a lot going on too. And it was, it, it was a fun time, but it was a trying time because, you know, I was, you know, I was like, shoot, I'm going to just try to hit a home run every bat, you know, and stuff like that. And I, I really wasn't thinking with my head screwed on right in the beginning, uh, trying to uh, probably do too much and make it to the big leagues fast, but minor league baseball was tough. Did, uh, did, did all of that, you know, you talked about obviously missing football and you know, grinding through the minor leagues where it's, you know, it's hot and you're, you're 10 people there. Was that all of that made a little bit easier with your roommate and friend at the time, Kevin Millar? Did he kind of help ease the the, the Florida, my, like the Marlins minor league transition for you? 
Yeah, he, he was, you know, he's one of the funniest guys, as you guys know, of being on TV daily. I mean, his his personality, as good a player as he was, his personality and leadership ability and just fun, you know, just a fun, awesome guy. And he, he came from, you know, not being drafted, free agent, St. Paul Saints, the whole thing. And he actually crossed the line. Uh, I remember him coming into our hotel room in Cocoa Beach and, and – um, and John Bowles, who was running the minor leagues uh, at the time, uh, he had he had called Kevin in and said, "Hey, would you like to cross the line and 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 go play, uh, you know, go play uh, scab, you know, baseball?" And and he goes, "You know, I he was in a ball. He never, you know, he he got like a, a plane ticket to go to get there. You know, he wasn't a prospect. He's like, dude, I got to go do it. I'm gonna get to go take BP in the big on the big field, like." He, that was what, it, you know, was important to him. And I said, dude, you might as well. What if you do well? And then next thing you know, you come back and maybe you go to double A and let's see what happens, you know. And I'm 19. He's 23 because he had played four years. He played junior college at L.A. City. He went to Bo, uh, Lamar and Beaumont, Lamar University, St. Paul. I mean, he had, he'd had four college years and an independent season. And I'm coming out of high school. I ain't hit you know, I haven't got anything, any at bats in really, but just a handful to his thousand, you know. And so watching him though, and how he went about it every day as a hitter, uh, was was pretty awesome for me because we we did the instructional league together. We did we played Portland Sea Dogs together. We his first at bat in the big leagues was a double switch for me in Pittsburgh. Um, and we so we got to come up and play even uh in the off season winter ball leagues together and stuff like that. And so we just really bonded spring training roommates. We really bonded and became best buddies. And we still are. I'm, I'll be there in his house in two weeks for the uh, Bama Texas game in Austin, you know, so we're with each other all the time. We were in LA for Poppy's event um, for his hall of fame party at, in Hollywood, uh, whatever, three weeks ago. But uh, anyways, yeah, he's, he's a, he's a unique character. He's uh he's a go getter. He's got he you know he's just a he's just a gamer man. He was a gamer. He always believed in himself, uh you know, and understood what he wanted to do at the plate. And whether he played decent defense or not, he always played decent defense. There's no doubt about that. He wasn't a real liability. He just could always hit because he just believed he was going to hit and he had the right approach. And he you know he keep everybody loose too. Which I've got so many stories about Kevin. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I love it. I'm an Orioles fan, and I watch him on MLB Network every day, and he's he's my favorite. So uh, is there one that stands out? Is there, like, a roommate story or just, like, you know, where you, where you guys are off the field doing something? Man, there's all kinds of stuff. He he actually lost my World Series ring, and and he's actually told this story on, uh, on Major League Baseball Network. I was there on set with him one time with Chris Rose, and, and uh, we were, at, we were at, at, at a football event uh, Super Bowl party that my agent was throwing in New Orleans. It was like Hawaiian tropic deal. It was, you know, this fun deal. And, and uh, he was like, can I wear your Royal Series ring? And I'm like, yeah, you can wear it. And he was just wanting to, I don't know why he wanted to wear the dang thing, but he wanted to wear it. This was back when he wanted in 97. I was, I'd gotten the ring. I'd, I'd only got a couple of bats in the year, but I did have a ring. And so this was like 2001 and we're all coming out of this football uh, Super Bowl party in, in New Orleans at Harris Casino. And it's like, I think Matt Hasselback, Joey Harrington, Bledsoe, Tim Couch, me, Millar, there's a bunch of us walking out and we're all talking about, it's like two or 3 a.m. And, you know, we've been having fun and, and <laughs> we're all talking about who's the best athlete of all. And I'm like, of all of us in the group, we're, I don't know why, how we got on this, but we're like, and so I go, guys, I'm an athlete, you know, I'm like, Y'all, y'all won Super Bowls and Bledsoe was there. You know, he's six six. He's a stud, first hundred million dollar guy. I'm like, dude, y'all ain't worth the darn. I'm the best athlete. Uh, you know, I, I played two sports. And I said, show him my World Series ring because we're at a football deal. And Millar looks down. He didn't have the ring on his finger, and I had just given it to him. And I'm like, what, what is going on? And Kevin sprints to the bathroom at Harris, and he had washed his hand. He went to wash his hands and set the ring down on the counter to wash because the ring was a little big and he left it. He left it in there and didn't even realize he walked away from my ring. He gets back over there and, you know, he runs back over there and I'm like, oh my God, he lost my World Series ring. He's, he's red and a tomato. And he goes, 
He goes, man, I don't know what to tell you. I was washing my hands in the bathroom. And I lost your World Series ring. I'm like, no way, bro. So I, he lost my World Series ring. It's a horror story, but it's a, it was pretty funny at the time because I never really wore the thing. And then when he won it in 2004, you know, I, I was there actually uh, at Fenway for the first couple of games, but I called him. And I go, dude, you owe me your ring. You know that, right? And he's like, oh my God. You know, anyways, I I didn't do that to him, but but at the same time, um, he did lose my World Series ring, which is a crazy story. And we've never seen it since. We've never seen it. <laughs> that, that, I wasn't expecting it to end that way. I thought he was gonna, I thought he was gonna find it. <laughs> yeah. No, he never found it. He, he we, oh we my still- god. This was 20 years ago. We're like, it'll never, it'll never show up. So I've got to get the thing re- remade, but I haven't done it yet because I just never wore it. But now that my kids are getting older, I kind of want to get the dang ring back. So I got to call the Marlins and deal with getting a new ring back. But um, anyways, it was, it was a quite a, quite a night. I was like, no, oh, let's just go to Bourbon Street, guys. Who cares? Let's go. So I didn't want it the night to ruin, but, but he was, he felt so bad. He's still sick to his stomach. So if you ever, if you ever, do a podcast interview with Kevin, bring that story up and, and get after his ass a little bit. <laughs> so somebody, somebody at Harris Casino that night it got real lucky and it's just quietly walking around with the Marlins World Series right, right now. Right. I'm, we've never That's seen it. That's crazy. I've never said they hit on eBay or anything. I've never heard. Oh, about my it. God. Yeah, it's that's crazy. That's crazy. That's a – that's a great. I mean, aside from actually losing the ring, the rest of that's a great story. <laughs> that's, that's a great story, though. <laughs> it's great. I got a bunch of them with Kevin, but that, that one is uh, one for the ages. That's for sure. But there is hope, though. So there is a possibility that, like, working with the Marlins, they can have like a like a replica, or like they can have another one they, made. Because I feel like that's a big yeah, deal. They, they can redo it. I, I, uh, you know, they didn't insure those rings. Like I didn't, I didn't even think about getting it insured. So I've got to go back through and buy the thing and go get sized and all that stuff. And I was living in California. I never really, you know, I wasn't a starter on the team. Uh, I was a rookie kind of coming up. So I, you know, I, I didn't even really wear it that much. So I, I but now I think I would, you know, um, getting older and my kid, I'd love for them to see it too. So I, I'm going to get the thing done. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean that that '97 Marlins team that you were on, even just like at the end there, they they had some like incredible players like Al Leiter and all these guys. Like, but I'm so fascinated with, by their manager Jim Leland that you played for. Um, I, everything I've heard from him, he he might be a bigger character than Kevin Millar. Just like the chain smoking in the dugout, the the anger, ra- like rage issues, things like what, what was your what was your experience playing for Jim Leland like? He was awesome, man. He was one of my favorite people of all time and he he really believed in me I was I was not ready I think to be in the starting lineup in 98 when I when I was uh the opening day starter at third base and and I think offensively I wasn't ready but defensively I was and he just said hey you know he he instilled so much positiveness in me that I could handle it uh you know at the plate and that I could really help him out on defense and it was, of course, the year after we won the World Series, how Zinga dumped the team or dumped a lot of the players. And so, you know, I was I was there and uh, at that time. And we had a lot of young, young guys. I mean, me and Kotze were rookies uh, in 98, the same – I mean, opening day starters in 98, and we had never been up there. there you know, Renteria, Louis Castilla, uh, Ryan Jackson was playing right field, a kid from Duke. Um, we just were real young. Um, LeVon was on the team and – Trying to think of some, but but Lighter and Brown and all those guys had left. Um, Cone was still there. They had a few Sheffield, but um, you know it was just a. He instilled a lot of confidence. He goes, dude, you you play better defense than Ken Caminiti, and I don't care if you hit one if you get one hit. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, that kind of took the pressure off of me. So I, things like that, uh, you know, I think he was a sports guy. He loved football. And so he was like, dude, you're my guy, dude. You're a football guy. You know, he just made me feel like, uh, you know, I would run through a wall for him. I mean, he just made me feel like I could do it. And, uh, you know, he jumped your butt if you if you made stupid mistakes. But that's what a manager should. And he was old school, you know. Uh, I enjoyed that about him. Um, he was tough, but, like, I played for Nick Saban, man, after that. And then Nick, Nick's a whole different level. 
but Jim Leland was a baseball guy. I mean, I'm, y'all probably seen the clip many times where he gets after bonds in spring training. Yeah. They get into it. I mean, he wasn't scared of nobody. He's five foot five, and you know, and he's got a he's got a he's got one in his mouth. You know, a cigarette in his mouth, and he just didn't care, man. Always walked around with a fungo, you know, and the old. He just he was, I guess, Pittsburgh. He was Pittsburgh, you know, and he brought that mentality, that hard work and steel town mentality like Pittsburgh Steeler pirate mentality uh to a team uh you know that had a bunch of stars and we we were able to win it because he was he he was gifted man at speaking um if you've ever heard him really sit down and speak he's really really good at speaking so all the if he talked you listened you listened Sean Casey tells a story about he interrupted his smoke break one time and he lit into him. Did you ever, ever have anything like that? Or did you know that when he lit one up, it's like, all right, that's, that's Jim's time. <laughs> he would light it up and he'd take a couple of puffs and then he'd throw it down. And so there would be like six packs at the end of a game that he had gone through, but it was all the cigarettes still, you know, full cigarettes. And I'm like, dude, why don't you just smoke on one, you know, for a little longer, you know, we would tease him about stuff like that, but you know, he was a, he did what he wanted to do, man. And he was, he was always thinking the game and he never really got on me about anything, but I wasn't there with him long, um, you know, a couple months here and there, um, just a fun guy to be around. And he was loose. He was a player's manager. There was no doubt about that. He just liked to win real. He really liked to win and he was going to make sure he didn't have a losing squad at, at you know, at all costs. That's great. I love those stories. You, you mentioned one of my guys in there, though, that I got to ask you about. Ryan Jackson was the nope. uh, was the hitting coordinator for the Reds when they when I got drafted and coming up. I'm still still talk to him today. So oh, you, what do you guys? Yeah, I talked to him, man, probably about, I don't know, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. Wow. You got to tell him, I said, man, we were I we, will definitely tell him that. <laughs> we played a lot of minor league ball together. He was, he always had some knee issues, um, but could flat out hit, man, just could flat out hit. Like it, I remember we were in Beloit, Wisconsin. It was like my first uh, uh, a ball game, uh, King County. We go up to Beloit and it's like seven degrees in Wisconsin in April, like the beginning of April, we're going to play Beloit and we're facing this guy, Kelly once, who was a, all-American at AM, big old lefty. And Ryan Jackson goes five for five in seven degree weather. I'm like, I'm like oh for five. I barely even touched the ball. It was so cold. I wasn't used to it. You know, Kelly wants a really good pitcher. And Jackson just goes bam, 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 bam. I'm like, what in the heck is this? So my first impression of Ryan Jackson was this cat can flat out hit. And then of course he made the big leagues a couple of years later when I was there as well. And uh, he earned it. He could hit, but he, you know, he got all that college experience too, and which was yeah. huge for him. But he had, he could hit every, you know, he hit at every level. It was, it was awesome. He's, uh, yeah, I love talking. Still love talking, hitting with him. But he helped me a lot when I first uh, was drafted there. We have a great relationship, and he is a very smart hitter, very smart hitting coach, um, and a great. I don't know what he was like back then. I'm sure he's, he's probably great. a little more intense. <laughs> but very uh, good demeanor and like calm uh, very, hitting coach presence these days. Yeah, he's a calm cat, man. He was always cool. He had the hair, you know, flow going. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hair That's like a awesome. in California, you know. But he was uh, just a great dude, a great teammate. Never said one thing bad about him. Just went about his work and would always be smiling. So I loved him. That's awesome. Yeah, I just uh, I had to get that in there when, when you said his name. That's cracking me up. That's amazing, dude. I'm glad, I'm glad you told me you played. You you, uh, you have a relationship with him. Awesome. Small world. Love that. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about 98. Can you take me through the 98 to 99, the transition? Like when did football come back into play? And then take me take me through going back to LSU. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do it kind of quickly, I guess, if I can. I, in 90, so 98 opening day, I got hurt. Uh, Jeremy Burnett slid over my thumb about a month into the season, and I went on the DL. When I came off the DL, like three months later, they sent me to Charlotte to play AAA ball. 
And uh, I struggled at the plate in Charlotte. The lights were, but lighting was bad. It was about to be football season again. And I'm like, I tried to get out of my contract in 97, but what happened was Huzinga didn't want to let me out. John Henry now on the Marlins and uh, in that off season after 98, uh, they said, I'm going to start in AAA again in Charlotte. And so I called Jeff Morad. I said, listen, if, if I can work a deal out with the Marlins and now owner John Henry, who's a Red Sox guy, Fenway sports group guy, uh, they said, uh, you know, then I'd love to go back and play at LSU with my brother in 99 and give it a year and see if I like football because I was going to be in AAA. If I, if I sat out one year, I could probably go back to AAA. You know, I'd been in the minor leagues three years, four years now, or pro ball kind of understood it. Um, been to the big leagues a little bit. Um, so I was like, I'm gonna go back and play. My brother was a receiver at LSU. He was awesome. Having a, having a pretty good, uh, had a pretty good freshman campaign. I'm like, I'm gonna throw to my brother, Tiger State. I'm gonna go back. I, uh, Henry let, let me out of my contract and I had a no football clause in my contract had one year left. So in 99, I go back and Jerry DiNardo was our coach. He had come from, I think Vanderbilt. He was at Notre Dame offensive line guy. I went to Vanderbilt, LSU hired and he, he's a big 10 network guy. Nice guy, not a real good fit for me because I'm a throwing quarterback and he liked to run the football. And it was like pound, 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 bigger, faster, stronger. It was no spread, you know, no three, four wide receiver sets. Anyways, so I go back in 99 and play for DiNardo. And we had a couple of guys hurt. My brother got hurt. My, another star receiver got hurt. We got three linemen hurt. We ran the ball for like 30 yards a game in the SEC. It was awful. And so I was always in third and long. And it was like, I got sacked 10 times against Florida in the, in the rain, you know, it was just a bad, it was a bad situation to be. We went four and seven to Nardo gets fired where I, our, uh, uh, our chancellor at LSU had come from Washington and it was Mark Emmert, who was the president of the NCAA until recently he resigned. But uh, Emmert said, I'm going to bring in this guy, Nick Saban from Michigan state. And, Saban put his staff together, uh, Jimbo Fisher, Derek Dooley, Muschamp, Kirby Smart, uh, Pellini. I mean, we had an unreal staff. And Jimbo was young, come from Cincinnati. Um, he had been under uh, Mark Rick at Florida State. Uh, just a brand, Brad Scott, he was like a quarterback coach. He was just a – Jimbo was awesome. He was just young guys, a lot of fire. And so these guys came in and – in 2000 and I'm like dude we might have a seat we might be all right with these cats and you no know, Nick Saban had never won a national championship so yeah, a lot changed between 99 and 2000 I, could, I didn't go back to baseball because I said man I got to redeem myself in football we were so bad so I went back to LSU in 2000 and said man I got all my all my chips were in football now because you know I did not want to leave LSU going four and seven and you know, coach getting fired. I wanted to play for Nick Saban and Jimbo. They got me fired up and I was ready to go. So, you know, I had to go and go and prove myself again, but we had a lot better year in 2000. And that's when I decided to, to try, try to go into the NFL draft after that year. So I got one year with those guys, but I was older now, you know, I was 24 years old. I'm like, I got to get to the league, man. I can't be in college with another group of 19, 20 year old kids, 18, 19, 20 year old kids. So, I kind of fast forwarded it myself and went and said, okay, I'm going to go to the combine and do all that stuff and ended up getting invited to that kind of stuff. So that's how I ended up, you know, LSU two years and then trying to get to the NFL to be a, to, to try to get to be a pro again, you know? That's fascinating. Yeah. I, I had a couple of LSU st uh, questions for you and you touched on one of them. What was it like being a 24 year old freshman? Did, did the age gap, was that, was that ever a thing? Um, it was a little bit. Um, there was a lot of, you know, LSU is a different place. Uh, you know, not a lot of academic superstars on the football team, that's for sure. And so, and not that I was at academia, it was just like, it was like going back in, in, in time, like to high school. I've been with Sheffield and Kevin Brown and Bonilla and, and all those guys. And then now I'm in the, I'm in math 101 with 19 years. Like, this is a little weird, man. You know, I'd been in Atlantic City with lighter, you know, a month before or whatever, hanging out. And so it was a little different. And so there was a there was a little bit of a, a barrier, but my brother was on the team and he had played well. He was younger. And I, you know, I loved all the guys. It was just like going back into class and 
parking and walking, you know, through the quad and going to class and getting book bags and all that. I was like, what is going on here? But it was, it was fun too, because I'd never got to experience that. So it was just a different deal, you know, for, 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 uh, I guess for me, um, being that had already played professional sports and gone back, uh, you know, Winky at the time had done that and gone to AAA. I think Quincy Carter was at Georgia. He had done it. He'd gone to a ball and done it. Um, Javon Walker was a receiver at, uh, at Florida State. He had done a ball and gone back. So there were some players that were doing it at the time. Uh, Chad Hutchinson, Stanford quarterback. Um, there were some guys that, that were doing it, but um, I, had, I had made the big leagues, and so it was a little bit different. And I bet it didn't hurt that you, you came into to college actually having money, which probably, you know, a lot of 18, 19 year old guides uh, probably didn't. So that I'm sure that helped you, you know, in the college part of college. It did. But, you know, everybody was always, you know, not they were kind of looking at me a little different and not it wasn't bad. It was just like, you know, I had I had the whole DB room come into the quarterback room one day and say, dude, we all, we all want to borrow like three or four grand, you know, and I'm like, what are you talking about guys? And they all, we all want motorcycles. Can you get us all motorcycles? I'm talking about, I'm not, I'm not, this ain't this before NIL. <laughs> I'm like, no, I, I can't do that. So, I mean, these two guys, Damien something and uh, uh, God, Fred Booker, two guys that were starters. I, I said, whoever starts, on that corner, our two corners. I'll I'll both I'll buy y'all both motorcycles. How about that? But I ain't buying everybody motorcycles. So I made them. So whoever starts game one gets motorcycles, and I got two motorcycles for this son of a gun. And it, there was just all kind of stuff. like Jimbo Fisher. I would go up to the to the quarterback room or whatever. We'd be watching film, and Jimbo had never had a big contract. Now he's making twelve million a year. But uh, you know, he would say, "Y'all want to get some pizza?" You know, we'd all go, "Yeah, let's get some pizza, coach." And then. Jimbo go, booty, go order the pizza. You got more money. So I'd have to go order the pizza. And I'm like, Jimbo, what? I got to order pizza. Put it on LSU, dude. What? what why? I got to order pizza. But I would just give him a hard time. And I'd go in there and order some dominoes and we'd bring it up. I mean, so I mean, just stuff like that where they had fun with it, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't that big a deal. Oh, that's Brian. That's I'm good. sure you, you know, in college, you, you I'm sure you wish you had a, a guy like that around in Rutgers. <laughs> Yeah, that would have that would have been re really nice, you know. But that's uh, those are some great stories, man. Those are awesome. <laughs> I got I got one of them. Um, I played with Sean O'Hara from Rutgers. He was a center, okay. backup center in Cleveland with me. And of course, now he's on NFL Network. But man, he's one of one of my favorite people of all time. So uh, if you ever run into him around Rutgers, man, he is he is salt of the earth, dude, too. Um, but I, we had a lot of fun together, me and Sean O'Hara in Cleveland for three years. Is is he a Pens – I think he's from around my area, too, actually. Is he a Pennsylvania guy? Yeah, I think he's Pennsylvania. Yep. I believe he is. He went to – but, um, of course, he's, he was always – brought he brought his Rutgers stuff all the time to the facility. I'm like, man, that's funny. <laughs> oh, he's well, Jersey, but yeah, he's uh, that's funny. I did definitely know that name. Yeah, he's I love right on Apple Network. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome, man. He's awesome. Good dude. You uh, you mentioned playing for Coach Saban, and just anytime I was like, you know, I was researching like, what are guys who play for Nick Saban say about him? And the word that came up the most was accountability. Like, what did that look like behind the scenes, like on the practice field, in the meeting rooms? Like, what, what did Coach Saban do so differently, you think? Uh, accountability is awesome. You know, everybody says pay, he pays attention to every little thing. It was, you know, it's a dictatorship, man, from, from the top down. I mean, it's like everybody gets held accountable. You can't miss one thing. And he sees it all. I don't know how he does it. He's got a lot of energy. He's a ball of fire. I mean, it, he, he had never proven himself either at the at the level he has now. So he had a lot to prove. I think when he came into LSU, he was, you know, it's the typical stuff like, you know, our team meeting room the first day, like we're going to win a championship here. I don't know if it's going to be with you jokers in the seats or the next group of jokers, but it's going to be, it's going to be here when I'm here. You know, that's the kind of stuff. He's like, all I need is three hours of sleep and I'm going to put in 20 hours of work a day, which is over time. That's going to, 
I'm going to be able to put in a whole lot more work than anybody, any other coach. So I'm going to whip anybody's ass, you know, at all times. And so it was like just the, just the, the, the energy of, I guess, commanding the room and at the same time paying attention to the little things and working smart, not just hard, but smart, uh, you know, and having great strength and conditioning programs, great hires, great recruiter. You pile all that together, you know, with a guy that knows how to, to, to get his points across because a lot of guys are great players or, or they know how to coach the position, but they can't get points across to every different type of person in the room and he can get it across. And I'm like, this guy's brilliant, man. He's smart. He's, he's, he'll get on your butt, but it's for a good reason. He only gets on you for, if it's for a good reason, then he's really coming down on you. It's like, I don't know, modern day Bear Bryant or something. I mean, the guy's unbelievable because he, he doesn't miss much. Um, Nothing slides, and he's he's got a room full of athletes because he's recruited his ass off. So you can't make mistakes because the next guy is going to take your job. And I think that's the competition part of playing under him is so good for everybody that plays under him because if you don't, if you you better not make mistakes, you better not jump off sides, you better run the right route, you better be in the right spot, you better understand zone coverage, you better understand what you're doing. You better get in the weight room. You better be getting better every day. Fat percentage, boom, boom, every little thing, you know, you can't miss a, a beat, not nothing. You know, you better carry your fakes out, every little thing. And so that's why he's the best is because he, he he doesn't tolerate anything. I love that. Uh, I, I had just one last thing, uh, but Brian, if you had anything else. No, I just I love the stories, man. This is this is great. I love hearing the different. We talk so much baseball in here. It's cool to hear some some of my my football stuff too to get me even more fired up for uh, the upcoming season here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. Yeah, the last thing I had was actually baseball related. So I remember back in 2013, you were on the Next Knuckler, which I think is MLB Network's first and only reality show. Um, yeah, uh, hosted by uh, Kevin Millar. So, what was your mindset back then that made you want to go out and say, you know what, there may be some unfinished business with baseball? Um, I just wanted to have fun doing a show. Uh, you know, Kevin had had said, man, they were looking at doing something, and then Major League Baseball Network called me and go, we're going to bring in some quarterbacks and we're going to throw uh, like a uh, the big break golf channel. You know, has the show. Uh, competition reality show and he goes that's what we're going to do with the knuckleball because aj dickey or what is name r.a dickey uh he had just won the cy young and that had never happened before and so they were wanting to do something fun and they they this guy david gavant who was the producer of the show um he had done some 30 for 30s he had done some awesome stuff and he said dude we want to do our first ever competition reality show on network will you come in and i said yeah i'll do it um it'd be fun. We did a, um, it was like two weeks at Dodger town in Vero beach. And, you know, they brought in Wakefield and, and Charlie Huff and we competed. I learned how to throw the knuckleball, but I had, you know, I had played baseball. None of these other guys had played baseball. And so, you know, I, it was like a natural fit for me uh, to, to, I think win the show, you know, to, to do okay enough to, to win it because these guys weren't throwing great knuckleballs. They were all right. I mean, we learned how to throw it, but I had, I had shag balls in the outfield and throw knuckleballs my whole life. Like, you know, I, I just played, been around baseball so much. So I had a knuckleball before we showed up, you know, a little bit of one, and then they taught me how to do it. And then I, you know, I can throw, you know, 88, 89, 90 fastball at that time, seven, eight years ago. So um, you know, if I got behind an account, I would just throw a fastball for a strike and, and get myself kind of back into the situation, into the bat a little bit. But it was fun for me because, you know, it, it was it got it was it was on TV, and then it, it got me to big league camp, and I went to the Diamondbacks and went to big league camp 15 years removed from the Marlins in big league camp in '98. So it was a quite a fun deal for me. Uh, Kirk Gibson and Steve Sachs and Mark Grace, they were all on the staff. And it was just fun to be back in the in baseball and put on a jersey and I pitched against the Giants three times in, in big league camp, stuff like that. It was just pretty, pretty fun throwing a knuckleball. I was ne I'd never been so nervous in my life. It was more nerve wracking than playing in Tiger Stadium with no offensive line help. Uh, <laughs> it was it was pretty it was pretty nerve-wracking to to just hope that they didn't hit this knuckleball you're throwing like 65 miles an hour. <laughs> but it was fun. that's great. 
Yeah, when when we had Mickey Janice on, who was a knuckleballer, he talked. That was like one thing. I'm like, dude, I feel like it takes some serious balls to go out there and throw a knuckleball because it's just so different. And I don't know, man. If I I would never want to pitch. If they ask me to pitch position player, I, I don't really enjoy that anyway. I'm kind of the scrooge of position player pitching, but uh, yeah. I wouldn't want to do it because I'd be I'd be afraid that someone's just going to smoke a ball right back at my face, and I'm not I'm not trying to have that happen. <laughs> so, but a knuckleball isn't that different. I mean, hope you're hoping it's moving, but if you don't throw a good one, it's not it's it's not very good. Yeah, it's like you got to be serious, but yeah, it's 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 funny, you know, because you're up there throwing yeah. a knuckle. Oh my god, you know, it's like they're bringing in the center fielder to throw anything, you know, in a game. 15 to nothing or something. It's like, but it was, you know, you got to be serious. You got those strikes, but like, you're almost like laughing inside going, I hope they don't hit this 500 feet. But, you know, if you get it moving, if you get it moved, dude, I struck out, I think I struck out five guys in three innings, like in the big leagues, in the, in the games, like they couldn't hit thing. And I'm like, this is unreal, man. I mean, I wish I'd have done this 15 years ago. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I could still be playing. I mean, Necro and them played to their 46, Charlie Huff, you know. Uh, my first day getting uh, – when I get when I signed with the Marlins in 1994, they brought me in for a press conference. I walk into the locker room. I see Sheffield and uh, some other guys in there, Benito Santiago, and Charlie Huff is going to pitch that night. And he's sitting on the couch smoking a, a cigarette, smoking a dark. He goes, hey, kid. And I'm like, and he's at the very end, and I'm like 18 years old. He's like, hey, kid. He goes, I heard you're a Marlin now. And I'm like, yeah, I am, man. I'm so excited. Nice to meet you, Charlie, because I knew all these guys. You know, I, I had done my homework and I had baseball cards of all these guys growing up. And I'm like, nice to meet you. He goes, did you bring your golf clubs? And I said, no. I said, I wish I had time to play golf. I said, I'm, I'm fixing to go to the minor leagues and I'll probably see you back here in two or three years. You know, he goes, well, if you had your clubs, I was going to take you golfing tomorrow. And he's smoking a cigarette in the locker room. Then he's going out to pitch. So I go, so I go up in the stands with with Hazinga and my agent and my parents and I, and Chuff, uh, Charlie walks out, Huff walks out and pitches. 10, 20 minutes later, he's on the mound. He had just been smoking in the locker room. I'm like, this is un- <laughs> yeah. It's just the times have changed, but that was that was my uh, I guess my initial um, you know few minutes uh, with the Marlins was Charlie Huff in the locker room, smoking a cigarette, you know, uh, right before he walked out to pit. It's pretty unbelievable. That's fantastic. The game's come a long way. Yeah. It is. Big time. Oh, last, last thing. Yeah, we mentioned this before we started taping, but life after baseball. Can you take me through that? And then also, what what's the – you have like a new business venture going on. Yeah, brother. Thanks for asking. Um, So me and my youngest brother, Jack – um. He came up with this idea uh, to to put a social call to action play together on the blockchain. So it's like peer to peer gambling, but it's it's challenges, dares and wagers. And uh, it's one on one. So I could bet you video games or uh, bar games or football games or whatever. It's just betting, but peer to peer. So you're taking out the bookie out of the situation and it's on on a social environment. So it gives you a chance to. You know, I could call you out, trash talk, and then you'd have to accept it. Bula is the name of the company. If you can see it, B-U-L-A. I got this little arcade guy. Bula means wishing you luck or life. It's like Aloha. It's Fijian word. So we went with this uh, word Bula. So if you go on BulaChallenge.com, you'll see, uh, you'll kind of see what we're going to be doing. We're launching September 2nd around college football, of course, university marketing campaigns, kids, uh, football games, stadiums, iconic bars, uh, especially in the SEC. We're going to launch their NIL deals and stuff like that. But it's a it's a call to action social app. So the content's all going to be like, I bet you I can do this better than you. And then there you can put whatever you want on it. So it memorializes it. Um, you can bet for pride or for money or whatever. That's incredible. The, the logo and the, I didn't even put that together. Your, your logo is fantastic. And I absolutely will be checking that out. That's That sounds amazing. Thank you. Thank you, man. We're, we're excited about it. We've been working on it like a year and a half. The tech stack is, is really difficult, but it's going to be like TikTok, uh, you know, with, with a verdict, um, you know, big media, Instagram story, TikTok with a verdict. So uh, you can challenge anybody, anytime, anything. And then it's on the blockchain, which is like immutable ledger stuff. So you can't back out of a bet. So it's like 
on hole number one, I bet you a hundred dollars a hole. Well, you can't back out after nine holes. It's set in stone. So that's what was, that's why we did it. No one's ever done it like this. We're not the bookie. We're not bar school MGM Caesars. We're like peer to peer action period. I love that. That is, that is so cool. This has been probably one of my favorite interviews we've done. I don't think I've laughed this hard. Your, your stories are fantastic. I mean, you know, I can't thank you enough for hopping on tonight. Man, thank you guys for having me. I, it was a real pleasure. Nice to meet you guys over the phone, and hopefully we'll get to see each other in person and catch a ball game one day.